years. I was on TV for three or four years before I dared actually watch one of my programs to see if my Japanese was really up to it. First of all, I want to thank you so much for being here this morning. Oh, no problem. Right. And I want to apologize for yesterday because you were uh, actually here and I we got the time, I mean, I got the time messed up and you were so gracious to forgive me for that and say you'd come today, the next day. Well, you know, the same thing could happen to me. I'm, I'm always afraid that I'm going to do that, miss the appointment right. or get the, the information wrong. And so I really have a hard time being angry with anybody who actually did it. Yeah. So. Especially if you think it wasn't malicious. They weren't trying to, or they're just very... No. Not considering no, it. No, you're... And there's no malice. Right. And, you know, for, but for the grace of God, there go I. There you go. So I don't hold that against anybody. That's what you said to me this morning when I met you at your car. Yeah. <laughs> for the grace of God, there go I. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, let's start off with where were you born? I was born in Pocatello, Idaho in 1952. We're both the same age. What, what month? May. Okay, so you're my senior because I'm October. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so you're 71 already. Yeah. Yeah, and I yep. turned 71 so, this year too. You barely turned 71. Yeah, but we're both we're both dragons though. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We call our uh, house in America Dragonwood High. Dragonwood. Where is that? Oh, but, that means you mean your house? Whose house? When you say your house, your wife my, and your my wife and I have a house in Utah, and we we call it Dragonwood. Was it because of that? Uh, uh, yeah, she was born a month before I was, so we're both dragons. And uh, in in the entryway, it's a marble entryway, and we had it a dragon carved into the marble. So it's a, it's nobody understands it, so it's no big deal. But but you do. Yeah, we do. You know, it only cost eight hundred dollars to carve oh, a dragon it's... into the marble. <laughs> Beautiful. But it makes us feel good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Do you have dragons around your house here? No, and my house here is, we don't have the luxury of doing stuff like that with the house here. Oh, you don't feel it's necessary? Because most people don't entertain in Japan in their homes. No, I, I can. It isn't very big, though. It's it's one, it's a, you know, it's one of these that's stacked up. Okay. okay. You know, it goes several levels. So it, with the ground space is good, you? Or more? Oh, no, it's more like 25. Well, that's why you went up. You know. Yeah, but we didn't put any walls in that you just go up if you want to change rooms. So <laughs> it seems a lot bigger than that. Beautiful. So you can actually see? You can actually see? Yeah, you, you can go back and forth. So if you're on the first floor, you can see the basement and you can see the upper floor oh, and you can see the floor you're on. So it seems three times bigger than if I had put in walls and doors. Right. Oh, really? And we just carpeted the whole thing so the sound is no problem. And it keeps you healthy because you got to go up and down. <laughs> yep, that's right. It's, it's, it's bad if if you have bad knees. It's bad, but yeah. Um, but you don't have bad knees, hopefully. Well, I don't now. Okay. I got one fake knee here. All right. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, when you were growing up, born in Idaho, Idaho. Yeah. But uh, my father was in the service. That was during the Korean War. Okay. So my and he and my mother were both from Idaho. So mm -hmm. she went back to there to have me. He was in California doing training and then after about six weeks we went to California to be with him okay. lived there until he got out of the service he never actually went to Korea but he could um, when he got out of the service we moved to Provo Utah he went to the university to BYU Brigham Young University and then we just stayed in there in that city the whole time we're both Mormons yep. from from the beginning like five generations five generations yeah. on both sides yeah okay oh do you have siblings yeah, I have, I'm the oldest of six. I have two sisters and three sisters and two brothers. The brother's the youngest? Did you no. know that in order? We have, I had, I had two sisters and then a, two brothers. And then there was a 16 year gap and then they had one more girl. So, and it was really funny because um, I was thinking about getting engaged and my mother was in really bad shape and I said, Mom, you need to go to the doctor and find out what's the matter with you and get it fixed. So she did. She came back, Kat. I said, what? She said, the doctor said it can't be fixed. 
I said, what is it? She said, I'm pregnant. What? I'm going to get engaged next month, and you're pregnant? So, uh, Wait, how old were you at that time? I was 25. 25. So I, we did... Uh, Wait, were you living here, or were you living... No, I was, I was still in graduate school. In at graduate school. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, we, uh, we had the wedding reception, and you know, you've seen one where the bride was... You've never seen one where the mother was. But anyway. And you had that. Yep. <laughs> and it was funny because it kind of uh, caused a mini epidemic in the neighborhood. A lot of the older women got pregnant. <laughs> so, so, that right? so my my little sister actually had lots of friends in the neighborhood who mm. were born around the same time. Born, well, it so was kind of funny. Growing up, you were the first son, the first child. Yeah. How are your parents doing? Are they okay? They're died. They're dead. Mm-hmm. They died. Yeah. Okay. Has it been wild since they've been? Yeah, it's been a few years. Okay. Your sisters and brothers are all okay? Yeah, they're all fine. The, was good. My one, my youngest sister lives in, in near Boise, Idaho, but the rest of them live in Utah. Did you guys grow up to be close with each other? Yeah, no, no, I think so. I, was, mm. I don't know what close means. We're close, yeah. Yeah? I don't mean in distance. I mean, do you talk with each other? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. nobody has... Because you know how they have feuds sometimes in families. Yeah, but you know, when my father and mother were dying mm-hmm. uh, they didn't just die in a car accident they were they both had cancer and so um my father was determined that there would be no contention after the death and so all of the uh, all of the assets were divided up in advance put into trusts and stuff so that nobody could do anything foolish and uh and then um so, and we all, so there was no problem with that. That's beautiful. So we've, we, uh, we sold the family house and divided up the proceeds, you know, one sixth each. That's beautiful. So it was, it's too bad because it's worth about double that now. But, um, uh, you guys weren't thinking like that. Oh, just, you know, we, nobody wanted to live there, right? Nobody wanted to live there. And there was a guy who really wanted it. My dad had expressed his intention to sell it to this guy. And so we just did. Mm-hmm. But anyway, mm-hmm. it's all right. Oh, that's good. We, we're all okay. That's, that's good. Growing up, were you more academic as a little kid in elementary school, or were you more physical? I think I was more academic. I, would, I, uh, I started playing the piano when I was five. Um, and uh, by the time I was in, in uh, by the time I uh, went and got into seventh grade, I was playing Beethoven and Chopin and all that stuff. So I was basically topped out. After that, I got busy at school and didn't practice very much. But I got, I took lessons till I was freshman in college. Do you play now? I do. Yeah, I played. I I played the organ for our church meetings. Okay. Do you have a piano at home? I did. Okay. But I got rid of it. Too much space. Yeah, I had a grand piano in my basement, but it took up too much space, and we had a flood, and we had to put in a new floor, so I just took it out and put in flooring, and it was, works much better. It's much more useful. So now you play the organ at church at times? Uh-huh. Yeah. But isn't that a little bit different than playing regular piano? You have to learn. Yeah, and... it is. It's a little different. It's. Um, I took organ lessons, too, mm-hmm. for a, a short time. But it's not that much different. Right. That you got to learn how to use your pedal. pedals. Pedals, you have more the pedals, and, right. and everything has to be, everything, basically is legato. Right. Whereas piano, you have a pedal. Right. And you can jump around. And if you work, and you have to be a lot more, <laughs> a lot more deliberate about how you play it. Right. And but uh, we have a brand new church in uh, Minami Azabu. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, and uh, we mean, right. well, I mean, they saw the redevelopment. If that's what you're talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah, right across the street from Elizabeth Park. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've been. Uh, I was in the old one. I've been in the old one. Yeah. Well, they've got a they got a new one. A new. And then the chapel is very large. It seats about 800 people if you open up the back. And we put in uh, probably the best organ that Allen Organ Company makes. Huh. And so it's really fun when I play. So, when we have a big meeting, right? You know, and I just let it ri- rip. You go, for it. you go for it. A few people say you play too loud. I don't play this so You don't put your hands over here. I said, sit, sit in the back. <laughs> sit in the it's back. not as loud. Back Listen, earplug, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna let it rip. I, I have fun. We, I don't like playing hymns that are like dirges. That's yeah. so boring. <laughs> so you really go for it. Yep. 
and they can't stop you. Gonna... Well, <laughs> What's yeah, because I'm in charge of the music. <laughs> <laughs> so when they come, when they know, when Ken's playing, they know there's going to be a recital. There's going to be a play. You're going to yeah. play it. So I, how long does one? How long does one of your songs go on? What's well, it's just a boy, just a him. Okay. Shall never, you know. Okay. Three to five minutes. <laughs> Would you go into it? Yeah, I really let it, let it rip. All right. Well, listen. So growing up, did you, were you encouraged to play the piano by your mother? Or, you she, know, my mother claims that she never had to ask me to practice. Okay. So I really enjoyed it. So um, yeah. I didn't do much sports. I really wasn't into sports. So um, I in high school, I thought maybe I should do wrestling. That lasted two weeks. You know. You find it, this is a well, word. I can hold on to them forever, but there's nothing, I can't do anything far that, past that, you know? <laughs> so, is that right? So, you yeah. weren't physical at all. You tried and you, that was, well, no, I, I, wouldn't, I was in phys good physical shape, but I didn't, didn't actually go for team sports. I've, I did, I'd, I've done, in, in college, I used to play a lot of racquetball. Yes. And, uh, that was a bit. And uh, I used to run. When I was a senior, I took, I had my one half PDE credit left, and so I took jogging. Okay. And so I got into really this good. this is in Utah. Yeah, at BYU. So I had mm -hmm. really good, I got into really good shape mm -hmm. um, through that class because you had to run like, I don't know, 180 million miles. But anyway, um, when it was over, I said, boy, this would be a real shame not to keep this going. So until the, after that, I went to graduate school for four years. So. For about those last five years, I ran six days a week, and I always ran every day except Sunday. For how long? Oh, we just did three, you know, three miles. Okay. Go kiddo. And so, um, but I had a friend who didn't like running, and I really didn't enjoy running, but we were both sort of sadistic and loved to make the other person suffer, and so we would go mainly because he wanted to make the other person suffer. You both had that going on. We both had that going on, and we kept that up until the day I graduated. So when I came to Japan, I could uh, take one of these deep subway stations, run up the stairs all the way to the top, and wouldn't change my heart rate a bit. So I joined the National Stadium Club, and I used to run on the track there because I was working in Aoyama Chobe. Well, first of all, what brought you here? Was it, were you, were you, Sent by the church? When I was 19, I was sent on a mission. Okay. You know, that's a volunteer thing. Right. And I was, I served in Kyushu basically for about two years, a little under two years. Because you don't pick them. You just, you, it's real. Yeah. yeah, you just say, yeah, I'll go. And they, I'll they go, and they pick the place. Yeah, they pick the place. Did you want to come to Japan, though? No, I didn't. Japan was nowhere in my mind. Where'd you want to go? Since you volunteered, you must well, I thought England would be nice. I wouldn't have to learn a language. My my dad said, so it's a little accent. Well, my ancestors are basically from oh, England. England. And, so, um, and they sent me this thing that said Japan. And I'm like, well, where's J Japan? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an island off the coast of China, right? right. That's about. That's right. You know, and so, but. Because uh, you're talking, this is the 70s. Yeah. 71. 71, 71 right. And uh, so. They had a what they called the language training mission. It was a two out a two month crash course, which they taught at the at uh, Church College of Hawaii, which is now BYU Hawaii on in Laie in Hawaii. So I went there for two months. So you're basically locked in the building and t and for two months and uh, no swimming. Intensive. Yeah, we had one hour of physical activity each day. You could go down to the beach and look at it, but you couldn't get in the water. Reading and writing as well. No. Just speaking. Yeah, just speaking. And uh, it was all in Romachi. Okay. But we did learn hiragana and katakana. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got to Japan, then I came straight to Japan. That was in December of 1971. Went straight to Kyushu. And I, you know, they had these little Sanseido dictionaries, you know. And uh, everybody carried one around in their pocket. And they came in Romachi and they came in hiragana. I took the hiragana one because I said I should, you know, I should try to, you can't live in Romaji in this country. So so uh, that was helpful. But it was, once in a while it was a little confusing because a lot of uh, a, a church people talk about a fuiki, you know? And I said, 
F U N I K I and it doesn't come up. Okay. So Fu Ni Ki, it doesn't come up. I mean, that isn't the word. It's Fu Ing E Ki. Fu Ng E Ki. Yeah, Fu Ni Ki. Okay. And so it took me a couple of weeks to realize that isn't N I, that's N and then I, if you're thinking in Romaji. So right. Fu Ng E Ki, and there it was. I go, oh, okay. All right. So we've got to be a little more careful with our pronunciation here. Right. And, uh, but I carried that around the whole time and basically. And you stayed for how long? Is it two years? Yeah, I stayed until October of 73. Right. I was basically in Fukuoka, Kita Kyushu, Sasha. So you, so you completed your mission. Yeah. Because sometimes people don't. They can't make it through and the shame for it. Well, like, yeah, it's rare, but occasionally people have health issues. Or right, whatever. right. Um, but uh, I went back and, and uh, ha having learned Japanese, that gave me 16 credits. I already had 16 AP credits. So that just made me a junior in college after I'd only been to college for one year. I, I went for one year and then went on there since. So. And became a junior. Yeah, so, you know, those extra credits made me a junior. And, and so I just majored in Japanese and Asian studies and, and uh, did a double major and got out in seven semesters. And then I went to law school. I just went straight into the BYU law school. I, the thing is, I had full ride scholarships the whole time. The so, whole time. yeah, it was wonderful. We came out with no debt. So I and and uh, so I started law school, and then the I second see, we came out. You who, well, in, in I the first year I did law school. I'm a single by then. Okay, I was right. a single until then. And okay, when I uh, in my second year, I decided to do an MBA also. And so, in the middle of that, we got married. And no, you met your wife. The, the no, old, she's a girl from the neighborhood. Okay. We, we've we've known each other since uh, seventh grade. Right. But you say a girl from the neighborhood, like as if the, the, this is the feeling I got when you said it. Girl from the neighborhood. She's gonna be with you forever. You know. I mean, literally forever. Yeah, but she was uh, she was basically what I needed, and and she loved me, and so I said okay. <laughs> and so we got married. And uh, we had our first son, Richard, in night. We got married in nineteen in October of seventy seven. We had our first son, Richard, in July of seventy eight. So, I mean, it was basically a honeymoon baby. And and uh, and then in uh, and he was actually born here because I was doing a law internship during the summer that year. Where at Baker and McKenzie? Yeah, out at Tokyo I'm a law office, and then. Um, they hired me on in 1980, full time, and I we moved here. My oldest son Richard was two years and one month, because we moved here in August. My second son Brett was born that spring, in March, so he was five months old. So the four of us moved to Tokyo. Your wife wanted to come back. She wanted to be here. Um, well, she'd been here because I mean she had our oldest son here. Right, the which was not yeah. the best, but that's okay. But her family's not here. No, and she's an only child. Her okay. her mother um, was very upset about it. Oh, she wouldn't even come to the airport to see us off. She said, "I want to cry in front of everybody." But it was okay. And um, we weren't planning to stay forever. <laughs> you, no, you I I uh, I I was thinking five years. I told the law firm four years. Told my wife three years. Um, and what I wanted to do, because in those days, if you'll recall, there were no attorneys in the United States who both spoke Japanese and had experience practicing law in Japan. There could have been maybe five okay. in the whole country. Right. So I thought, I'll, I'll get some experience here. I'll go back in the United States. I'll be the authority on Japan. And it, and it was a good plan. And so I started working there uh, in the law firm. It was busy. It was really... It's quite fun though. And then problem is in 1983, I started doing television work and that yeah, grew. How, how did that start and why? Well, um, you know, Tokyo International Players, right? Yes. Well, they were doing a play in, in January, of January 31st, 1983. Uh, the male lead dropped out at the end of December. Was it even on? Uh, that was the imaginary invalid on Moye. Okay. And we did it right here in the Tokyo American Club up on the old board floor. You know, the top the old, attack? Yeah, the top of That's right. And, and uh, oh, really? Yeah. Well, anyway, so um, 
the director was a friend of mine. And uh, he called up and he said, I got this horrible problem. I need a young guy who can play the piano and, uh, and is good looking. And, you know, and I said, well, Gordon, you know, keep it coming. You know, you know, this one. You know, you, I, I, got you here, going yeah. so I said to my wife, you know, I really don't want a bad review in the Japan Times. This is not a large society. Tell me about it. She said, yeah, 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 but you did, you did some drama in high school and, and even afterwards. And I, and she said, yeah, but anything fun since you started working at the law firm, just do it for a month. You know, Gordon needs you. So I did it. And there was a, uh. Some of the staff of Tokyo International Players are Japanese, but married to Americans. And so the lighting girl was married to a, a Japanese guy who had an agency who was providing all of the extras for the NHK dramas, all the gaijin extras. Okay. And, and uh, he saw it, and the girl who played opposite me, who taught at Sacred Heart, I think, or Seisen, one or the other, and she, uh, we kind of, we apparently we looked good together, and he was... He had her under contract to do a commercial for NEC, and so he didn't have the mail yet. And so he, he said to her, why don't we just use Kent? She goes, yeah, that would be great. So we did a commercial for NEC, and uh, and it went okay. And then, you know, a couple months later, he said, you want to do a drama with Pakeshita Keiko? Remember her? Yes. You know, the, the one that most people want to marry? I said, hey, yeah, I'll do one. And, and so on a Saturday... We went to Kanazawa and did just one scene, and uh, I was so excited. I'm going to be on TV. I told all my friends, and they all watched it, and they didn't see my face because the scene, she was sitting, and I was standing, and it was the, the cut left my just cut off right here. So so, the, so you wouldn't know if you were Gaijin or Japanese? They wouldn't have known anything. But it, it, we were speaking English, which was, okay, right. which was the sort of the key to the plot. That's why it was sort of ayashi, as they say, you know? And so, I, okay, well, I did TV once. All right, back to work. And and then he later, a little bit, a couple months later, he said, you want to do a quiz show? And I said, I said, Jim, you want to make, want me to make a fool in, of myself in front of the entire nation? And he goes, no, 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 this is, this, you can do this. Come down to the, to the Foreign Correspondence Club. I'll show you a video. So I went down there. It was Sekai Marugoto, how much? It's just a, it's a one hour show, but you, you have to guess the price of only four things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it was really a fun show. And I, I did that. First time I went there, uh, I thought I was just a regular person type guest, you know. You know, a lot of quiz shows, they just use regular right. people. Um, but when I got there, I realized there were five, five panelists, and they were all celebrities. And I was, I occupied the gaijin seat because Ohashi Kyosen had it in his mind that there should be foreigners who can speak the language and who should uh, be participating in the media. So I actually, um, but, and I, but I answered the question really close and they were impressed. And so they said, come back next week. So I did in the next week. But the next week I realized, hey, this could be ongoing. And, uh, but I guess close again. They said, come back next week. The third week, I actually hit the price right on, won a trip around the world, which I never used. They cashed it in. But, uh, and so I was a regular on the show for eight years. Well, now, were there any other foreigners? That, what, what year is this you're talking about? This is 1983. So I was here because I think the only people on TV at the time, because you were the first Kent on TV, I know that. Right. Okay, and then and the Chuck did, Chuck just Chuck came on. Chuck came on too, because, and Chuck and I were in the same agency. So was oh, that right? So they kind of put us on, you know, back and forth. Now I have to tell you about Chuck because I was very close with Chuck. He helped me start my first company, and he was my best man at my wedding. Oh wow! Well, he's a great guy, I, and he's fantastic. But I told Chuck I was going to be, I was going to be his manager. Okay, I'm the one that convinced him to go on TV. I said, "You have Kansai Ben." You've done the wrestling thing. They know you. They call you the blue-eyed wolf. Yeah. You know, after the other sumo wrestler. And I said, you should go on. And I made this suggestion to him. Do not do anything silly. Yeah. Don't get on those silly, those, you know, those yeah. comedy shows. Right. And I said, I want you to be more like Kent Gilbert. He never, he always dresses sharp. He always comes in there. And he never lets them make a fool of him. Yep. Never. Yep. 
Then pops I have up. To, I'm an attorney, for heaven's sake. But then pops up Ken Gil, Gilbert. Dere, I mean, Ken Gil, Dere, Delegate. Derricott. Derricott. Yeah. Ken Derricott. I mean, well, that was, and you guys were just night and day. Well, you know, Derricott um, uh, was, like, I had a law degree and everything. Derricott dropped out of college to move here and do um do some business and, and he, he was, did and he was doing business and he was very successful at it and but he saw me on tv and he said oh i can do that so he went to the auditions for what at the e the tom you know, the tom Mori, and you know you get that yeah, so you, but but i didn't really want to do comedy either right. um although i tried to be witty without being silly slapstick right yeah and so he kind of took over that part chuck took over the he-man part he did some slapstick, and then he got upset. Yeah, he did some, but and he he did more than he should have, in my opinion. But anyway, right and then, but I tried to stay the more serious. And then while we were doing that show, they started this show called Sunday Morning, which is still running. Yes, it's now turned into a leftist diatribe. But at the time, it, we had people from both sides of of the political aisle, and we would actually discuss stuff on the program. And I was I sort of represented the conservative. Uh, U.S. side, and um, Derek Ott was on there too, but I was the one who was actually doing the speaking for the, for the U.S. side and for me, and it was hard to, di- to differentiate those. But I did that show for ten years, and then they uh, it was taken over by the uh, news division of TBS, and they changed it and made it very left, mm-hmm. and now it's there's no meaningful discussion occurring there um but it's it's a it's a fine show it's just i don't agree with what they do now you know it's while i was on there it was very interesting um but it's interesting times that was a bubble time too yeah it was it was the bubble time and there was some it was a it was a really dynamic time and then you know after the chuck and Der- Derek Hart and i were on tv a lot of other people, other foreigners came on. Dave Spector. Dave, Dave Spector, he wanted to be on before us. Dave was in our agency, too. But Dave and I are really good friends. Yes. And he took over the the uh, the little more highbrow comedy type. Right. And then uh, there were some others, like San Con San, and there was a few of them that they had their little niches. But uh, basically it was uh, just, I was the first. And the, 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 I, I think I was the first person who actually would, you know, one one time, let me just give you an example. One time they had some product from Sweden that they introduced on the show. And I couldn't follow what they were talking about. So then I was supposed to guess the price. So I guessed it. And then they asked, you know, why did you put that out? And I gave them some, some BS answer. And afterwards, the director came up to me and he says, Kent, what is the matter with you? He said... You didn't understand that question, obviously, because your answer proved it. And now I'm going to have to edit that whole part out. He said, you are in charge of one-fifth, because there's only five people. You're in charge of one-fifth of this show. And I was so, you know, (laughs) so he would feel bad as he's yelling at me. I I felt so um, flattered that they actually believed I could do a fifth of the show. And so... It gave me a great deal of confidence. There was, it was several years. I was on TV for three or four years before I dared actually watch one of my programs to see if my Japanese was really up to it. And when I heard it, I said, oh, this isn't so bad. So bad. This is you imagine it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. This is an interesting. So what we do to ourselves. But that, that was, that was a, a really revolutionary concept in the Japanese media industry. Oh, how she kills and started it. And then it took a couple of months, but the other, TV stations all started using foreigners, and now they, is, you, instead of using foreigners, they use halves. The law firm wasn't pleased with it, and they, yeah. you have to choose. Okay, I'll choose, but you have to realize one commercial contract is worth more to me than what you pay me in the whole year, including my bonus, and I've got four commercials running. If I quit, there's no way I'd be able to pay that off. So I said, um, sorry, I mean, I went to law school and college and stuff for 10 years and prepared to be an attorney, but I think we're just going to change directions here. And you did. They were flabbergasted. And you did. 
And they did, and they let me stay on for two more years as what they call law of counsel. It means you just show up when you can and get paid for what you did. It took me two years to get all of my business, uh, all of my accounts, fund off onto other people. When I finally quit, they took my salary, cut it in half, and hired two people to replace me, which I was flattered about that. So what do you do now? What do I do now? Well, so... No, wait, how long have you been in Japan now from the time you came... After you came back, after you did your... Well, 1980. We came back in 1980, and so that's, what, 43 years? 43 years. Do you have intentions on staying indefinitely, or are you going to go back? Well, I have a house here that's paid off, and I have a house there that's paid off. And uh, you're going to make it 50 Our family just doesn't pay much attention to national borders. We go back and forth, and in the, and nowadays you've got Facebook Messenger, so it doesn't even cost anything to make a phone call. And you can see each other, too. And see each other, and uh, like you so my, my two oldest boys went to American school in Japan through... Uh, when, when my oldest boy, Richard, graduated from eighth grade from middle school, um, I sent him back to the U.S. So the, the two older ones were in junior high school in the U.S., the younger one, the youngest one, was still in grade school, but I sent him back to the U.S. I to stay with your parents? No, no. My wife went with him. Oh, okay. And so I got stuck staying here, so we moved out of our gaijin apartment where you have to pay a fortune right. and just build a house, and I paid it off last October. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah for sure. So anyway... Um, but I go over, and they come over, and we go back and forth. Oh, so that's what it is now, too. Yeah. So sometimes you'll be here alone, yep. and they'll come over, and then you'll go back yeah. over there. Yeah, and uh, are right. you, so are you, so your main, what you're doing now is basically television work? Uh, no, because um, Terebi Hodo, mm-hmm. television reporting is so biased these days. It's just, it's like the U.S. Everything is, is uh, one-sided. Yeah. One-sided, and, and so I've I've come out against that, and so the TV stations all hate me. So I don't get on radar TV, but there's internet TV. Mm-hmm. I, I did Tour de Lomo News till that was canceled recently, and now that's back, and I'm doing that. Um, that's a popular internet t- news show. And I have my own YouTube channel, which I haven't updated for about six months. I need to get back doing that. No, what do you do? But your YouTube channel, what do you do? You just... Did you record yourself and talk about issues you're interested in? Yeah, um, especially during the uh, 20, 2020 election. Right. I, I did a whole election series on that, and it was it's still there. You can go watch How it. many subscribers do you have on it? Oh, I don't know, 15,000, something like that. 15,000? I don't know. It may have gone down a little bit. but it's That's right, because, of course, you're TV talent, too, so I would imagine most of them would be Japanese. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and do you do it in English or do I you do it in Japanese? Japanese? You do it in Japanese, okay? So yeah, of course, because that's what it would be. Yeah. And then, so, and I write books. I've written sixty-three books. On what? You name it. Um, history, uh, Japanese culture. I've written, for example, I've written uh, three books about the Tokyo war crimes trials, um, which I think were a, a total farce. Um, I've written two about the emperor, the emperor system. I've written several about the media, um, and uh, probably five or six about constitutional revision, which we need to do. We need this, to revise this is the constitution in Japanese. You, you're basically yeah. most of it yeah. Japanese. Yeah, you, and people know you. Yeah, and they're on various things. I wrote, wrote one that the title was "The Fifteen Reasons Why I'm Still in Japan," and then I've um, I've done collaborative books with people. Uh, um, one that I did was with uh, um, Shirasaka Aki, who is the most famous Ginza mama. She's got a great business going down there. She basically runs Ginza 7 Chome. But uh, she's from Oita, and she got herself elected the other day to the uh, upper house. Is that right? Yeah, it was it was close, but she got elected. I was so happy for her. She's a wonderful woman. So you're keeping in you're you're keeping in touch with politics here, mm-hmm. with the social environment. You're yeah. really involved. Yeah. What are your what are your what are your biggest interests here in Japan? The ones that you want to see the biggest change take place in, or continue the way it is. Well, the um, the defense posture of Japan. 
Okay. It's very, very dangerous. It's, it's almost as bad as Ukraine. Not quite. But uh, supposing China were to invade Japan at this instant, nobody has guns, so well, they couldn't about, defend about themselves. The U.S. is based here now. Yeah, but will they do it? Will they defend Japan? I think so. If Japan doesn't show any will to defend themselves, will the U.S. just do it? The U.S. has the most to lose if they don't. I know, but Joe Biden is the president. And we know how he's done in the in Ukraine. You know, there's just little. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm, you know, the the um, status not the status of forces agreement. The uh, U.S. Japan mutual defense treaty has some provisions in there, but it it says in there that the only U.S. only needs to defend Japan if it's in the U.S. interest. Right. Of course. And if the U.S. decides that, uh, you know, Japan just isn't worth it anymore, they're done. And that's no way for a nation, for a nation, the third largest economy in the world, to be operating. You, know, you can't just base your defense on whatever America wants. That's no way to be. Mm -hmm. And so this is what Abe, Shinzo Abe, was talking about. He and, he and Trump really saw eye to eye on that. And uh, so he started trying to get their defense uh, posture ramped up and get, you know, amend the Constitution, and then he, after he got out, they assassinated him, which, you know, just sealed his his uh, position as a martyr and as a defender of Japan and their security. And then Kishida, and there was another guy, but Kishida came in, and Kishida has has uh, really taken that by the, taken the bull by the horns. They've doubled their defense outlays. They used to be 1% of GDP, now it's going to be 2 uh, within five years. And uh, they're putting in new missile systems. And the uh, the Japan, uh, U.S.-Japan security uh, um, situation has been revitalized. And uh, they're putting in new bases down around Okinawa and in, in parts of Okinawa. And uh, they've really woken up. But... The general populace is still a bunch of peacenecks, and uh, we call it Heiwanboke. Uh, Heiwanboke. It's Heiwanboke so, it means people who believe that peace will continue forever, even though nobody does anything to preserve it. I see. And that's uh, sort of a um, almost a Quaker type mentality. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're against. There's, there's a certain amount of people who say even if China Im invaded Japan, Japan should not resist. They should just go. Okay. There's le a little under ten percent of the Japanese populace actually believes that believes that that would be mm. the best way to do. Mm. So um, actually, you know, obviously this is not the way to run a the third largest economy in the world. And so. Um, the biggest thing that prop that happened recently is that Ukraine got invaded by Russia, and Japan. I mean, that was a wake up call for Japan. I mean, the same. It's the same. You know, I mean, it could be the, the only difference is that we have U.S. bases here, and the U.S. wants us to defend it for their own reasons. Right. Um, it's for their global strategy. The, the U.S. Uh, global, geo global defense posture is that you have Alaska and Okinawa. If you have those two. You've got the world covered. Right. It's really amazing. If you look at the globe from the side, Okinawa, if you look at it from the top, it's Alaska, and we're very heavy in both places. And so we have to keep that, and uh, um, that's the U.S. strategy. Uh, Japan has finally woken up to the fact that they are key to that. And so they Abe suggested the quad thing, where you get Australia and India and the U.S. and Japan to get together and try to defend the South China Sea and uh, keep China in check. That's a new one that's moving on. Right. That started with Abe. Are you involved in any of this outside, other than being outside? I'm not involved in actually doing any of it. And doing it. But I, I'm. Do they call you in for your opinion? Oh yeah, I, I write books about it all the time, and I, I give interviews and 
uh, you know, broadcasts about it. Okay, so it's one of your biggest passions now. Yeah, I give a lot of speeches. Like, yeah. This is one of my biggest. To whom? To anybody who will listen. But uh, I mean, but that in, I started on TV in 1983. Right. Uh, starting about the end of 83, I started doing speeches. In 1992 or 91, I actually did 276 speeches out of Tokyo in one year. I've been to every municipality that exists in Japan almost. I have not been to the top of Fuji. I have not been to Nemuro in Hokkaido. I, uh, Nemuro in Hokkaido I've never been to, but I've been to every other municipality in Hokkaido except Debun and Rishi. There was separate islands. But, um, so I've been everywhere in Japan. And, uh, and your speeches are basically based on Oh, just comparative culture, if nothing else. Okay, okay. It's really fun. But okay, it's not always the same thing. No, 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 no. It's, it's, you've been it's you want. The thing is, you're making sure that they... I do, sim you know, the government has me do symposiums on women's issues. I see. I did one on uh, traffic issues. I wrote a, a little thing for the, uh, for the Metropolitan Expressway here, and I gave them seven suggestions. And they took four of them and implemented them. It was amazing. Can you can you recall what they were? Well, one was taking uh, Hakuzaki and making it not a cross, but you go out around and over and up and over. Right. And they did it. They did it. And now Hakuzaki is no big whoopee. You know, and I said, you got to take the Wangondoro and got to make it wider. And they did. So they did, and they did it twice. Yes. And uh, I forgot what the others. There were a couple of others that would have been good if they'd have done them, but they didn't. Okay. It's okay. Um, and I was on the, the uh, committee to choose the fare for the Tokyo Wakawa Line tunnel that runs from Kawasaki to Chiba. Right. It's, a 50, it's 10 kilometers of tunnel and 5 kilometers of bridge. And uh, three weeks before it opened, they were trying to decide what to do about the fare. So we had this meeting, and I was on the committee, which you get paid for doing these things. Right. You know, this is the government. Right. And... Uh, I said, well, you need to have a variable fare. And I said, what? And I said, well, you know, not too many people. I mean, the trucks, um, if you give a lower cost, it would be advantageous for the trucks to use that thing at night for anybody who wants to go at night. So just have it cheaper at night and more expensive in the day. And they go like, they looked at me like I was from Mars. Mm -hmm. And nobody had thought about variable Variable it fares, is, yeah. but they did it, and it worked. And it worked, and they lowered it and lowered it. It's it's it started out at five thousand yen, but it's down to what I don't know twelve hundred or fifteen hundred yen now. Yeah. Um, and it's very it's very it's used a lot now. But um, when the Mishto took over the government there for a short time and almost ruined everything, they actually in, uh, instituted variable fares throughout the country. So. Variable fares is not a revolutionary concept, but I was the first one that suggested it. I mean, I, I, there's a few things like this. I'm the first one that suggested it, and it took off. So it, it's kind of fun. You should have a list of they should write a book on the first things. I should. I, you should then be great. That's an interesting idea. It would there's be. There's a few things that, that I've come up with that they've implemented, and it's been a lot better. So, right. do, you have any, do you have any one or two or three favorites that you think Well, about I'll give you one, okay? Okay. Uh, you know where the Supreme Court building is? Yes. It's on that. It's on the uh, Uchibori Dori that goes around the outside of the palace. And uh, if, if you're going around uh, counterclockwise, it used to, uh, to you'd get these big jams right there in front of that. There was only four lanes. And so one day I did a symposium for the Ministry of Construction about roads. And so it was like, in August, they held what's called Michi no Hi, right. Road Day. Right. And they called me in, and I said, well, you know, you need to just, uh, you know, there's places where you've got the land. You need to just make the road wider. And I, and I gave that as an example. A, a couple months later, they did. They made it five lanes, and it's never had a, uh, a, gem, a gem since. The, the same thing, the first one I suggested was... Wait, wait, let me start. The, Ken, when you're doing these suggestions... Do you go back somewhere and study about this? No, it's just because it can't just be off the top of your head. Well, what I live here, and I, I these so look at that I think things, about all the time. about when you're going through I mean, it. Take Tengenji Intersection, right? A lot of the people who are watching this probably live around here, right? And so they go through Tengenji. Tengenji used to have, if you're going from Hiro toward Meguro, 
There was one straight through, one left, and one right. And that isn't enough. It's in Ninji. Yeah. And so what would happen is people would get in the right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yes. Yes. So people would get in the right turn lane and just go straight because there wasn't enough. That's right. And I said, there, there's got plenty of land. That's that's the old uh, the old uh, streetcar terminal there. Right. Well, so there's plenty of land. And I right. said, just make it wider. Make two going straight. And I said, not only that, uh, you go through and go through the Meg Road Tunnel and turn right. And you go up Meg Road Dory. I said, Megro Doherty is so stupid, you shouldn't have the center line in the middle. I said, uh, you need to have three lanes going, uh, three, two lanes going out and three lanes coming in. So you just need to take the center line and move it over a little. Because if you have three lanes coming in, then you won't have all those jams at Yamate Doherty and Kanada and Kampachi as they're coming in on that. And uh, they did. Two weeks later, I go over there and they're repainting the intersection at, uh, at Tengenji. They widened it, and then and then after they did it even better, and uh, and then they moved the center line on Megro Dory over, so there's two lanes going out and three lanes coming in, and it, it flows beautifully. It does. It really does. And but before it didn't at all, right. and uh, the other street they needed to do that too. It's Nakarakaido, but it actually is it wide it enough kind of to do that. So I never go to Nakarakaido. But, but every now and then, what they're doing is they start to. I've noticed what they're doing. I, probably because of your suggestions. They go out to areas where they can and start to slowly buy up the homes, get them out, and put them back. And it takes a couple of years, for sure. No, it takes screen. a couple of decades. That's right. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that's that does. There is, there is a master plan for that. <laughs> is it? Yeah, there is a master plan. And uh, there's, you know, several things that I suggested. Like I said, Hodogaya Bypass, you gotta, that's got to be three lanes. So they said, yeah, yeah, we'll plan to do that in five years. It's on the plan. Yeah, so a lot of this is already on the plan. It's just it's just the that, time that said uh, it takes time to do it, and so mm. they're doing pretty. They're doing, uh, you know, the, the traffic situation is much better now than it used to be. That's right. That's right. And uh, but this is something that I was interested. They invited me back the next year, and I gave some more suggestions, and they did them. See, and that's all. Do and then the Metropolitan Expressway saw that and said, "Any suggestions for the expressway?" And I told them, and then they let me help them choose the fare for the tunnel and. So, you know, the, you just, um, I've done symposiums on women's issues, on, uh, on uh, human rights. Now, there's one thing I have to I say. I did a whole series on human rights. Nobody would have nobody would even thought about using you had you done silly things on TV. That's right. They wouldn't have touched you. I know, and that's... Um, it's a shame because a lot of those guys doing it really have knowledge and they understand this country too, but they're not going to take them seriously. Well, even if the TV viewers do... The bureaucrats won't. That's what I'm, I'm, no, the people I'm talking to, the people that have to take them seriously are the bureaucrats. That's right. The, the public aren't going to make any the, decisions. The bureaucrats take me seriously. They, that's the biggest thing. And that, and you master, you master. That's why I really, um, I feel a little bit of pride in that, that uh, they actually that's a understand that I'm not just out spouting and trying to get ratings. And try, I'm actually trying to. And for the funds only, you're doing it for oh, a purpose. Trying to improve that. Improve the society that I live in. And you're making a big difference. Yeah. I feel the same way, but not on a, a smaller scale. You know, the, uh, there's a Kamiosaki, there's an intersection there that's just a disaster. And I went over to Takanawa Police Station the other day. I just happened to be in the neighborhood and I just pulled in and I said, you know, you could fix that if you'd change the length of the stoplights. I said, Time you'd add right. five seconds to the right turn lane, you would really, really solve a lot of problems there. And they, said, and they did. And it actually is much better now. So now you're going to, that's how you look at things. Yeah. But I had three other suggestions, which they didn't do, and they should. And I, I'll have to go back someday. That's wonderful. But uh, Let me ask this before, because before, we're going to talk, and I'm, I want to have you back as many times as you'll come. Oh, sure. Yeah. Kent, I'd like to ask this question before I end the podcast. Okay. If you could go back in time with all the knowledge you have and all the help you've given Japan and talk to the younger Kent to give him advice, how old would that younger Kent be and what advice would you give him? In, in life, generally speaking, you've only got two or three big chances that come along. And uh, I wanted to be an attorney at the MBA, and I got that. I went to work for the biggest law firm. The re I did that so that I would have the flexibility to do anything I wanted. If you've ever worked for the biggest law firm as an attorney, you can go anywhere and do anything. So I wanted that, and that gave me flexibility. I 
this TV thing came clear out of the blue. Um, but writing books and giving speeches and all, all this just came as a part of that, which is in some ways an extension of an, of an attorney. You're expressing a view to people. And then instead of doing it in a courtroom, you do it in, either by way of a book or by way of a speech. And so um, in that respect, it's, it was all tied together, but, you know, I could have said, okay, I'll quit TV and I'll just be an attorney forever. You know, looking back, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I, it was a hard decision and it was sort of hard, but not really because uh, the economics of it were just too compelling. I don't know. I, I, I can't really think of anything that I'd do all that differently. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like and subscribe. And never forget, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the star. Because you're too blessed to be stressed. Mm -hmm.